Good morning. Thanks, Brian, and uh, thanks to all of you for being here uh, with us this morning. We are excited to see so many people who are interested in considering the importance of the life of the mind within Christian discipleship and looking forward to spending half a day uh, here with you thinking about that topic. As Brian mentioned, the Church and University Seminar typically addresses some topic at uh, the intersection of the church and the academy, and we've mixed things up a little bit this year. Um, instead of instead of considering a particular issue at that intersection of church and academy, we are thinking about the very intersection itself um, between uh, the church and the life of the mind as our topic for today. And so we want to ask, why is it that Christians should worry at all about being engaged with the life of the mind? Why does that matter for Christians? Why does that matter for the church? And why does that matter for the university and the wider culture? And of course, this relationship between uh, faith and reason is one of perennial interest. But as we're going to hear today, uh, it's partic particularly significant um, given the trends in modern culture to separate faith from reason and even to view these two as enemies. Uh, there are many in today's culture, both uh, outside of the church and some within it, that would uh, deny that the church has any legitimate business dealing in matters of knowledge. And because of this widespread misunderstanding about this relationship between faith and reason, it's, it's especially urgent for us today that we recover a uh, proper sense of the church's relationship to the life of the mind. So we're going to have plenty of opportunities today to discuss this theme together, not only thinking, thinking about it in theory, but also to think about what that looks like uh, practically in our churches and in our uh, respective vocations. So the seminar is going to be divided into um, three parts that are roughly an hour apiece, and we're going to be building in significant breaks uh, between sessions to give you a chance to move around a little bit, uh, and as Brian said, get to know others and process w what it is that you've been hearing. So we do want this to be an interactive seminar, uh, not just a, a one-way transfer of information. So please take advantage of those breaks to get to know others at your table, others who aren't at your table, um, if you haven't already begun to do so. In addition to the breaks today, we're going to be building in two interactive uh, Q&A periods, one just before lunch, and then we'll likely uh, continue that Q&A immediately after lunch. So please, as you're listening today, um, keep a running list of questions that come up, and we'll be sure to get to those questions uh, during our Q&A time. Before I introduce our speaker for today, I need to mention just a couple of uh, practical matters about our venue. If you haven't found it yet, which um, I doubt there are a few that haven't found it, there's coffee, tea, water at that station um, right in the back. Restrooms are just in the back hallway right behind this room, so out either door. And there's also a participant sign-up sheet at your table, uh, which if you would take a minute today to fill that out, that's really the best way to stay connected with us, um, get on our mailing list, find out about uh, more of these type of events that are going on. And finally, I want to take a moment to remind you to shut off your phones. I think I need to actually do that myself here. Um, both to minimize interruptions during the seminar, but also uh, because the light from your phone can inter interfere with the operation of the mirror ball during the dance portion of today's seminar. <laughs> so that's very important that we turn um, all the phones off. I want to uh, say just a few words introducing our speaker today. We are very excited to have Ken Myers joining us. Um, he's giving up a day in beautiful Virginia to be here with us, and sadly, he's not even getting the benefits of cooler weather uh, here in Minnesota. Ken may be uh, better equipped to address this topic of the life of the mind for this group that includes both uh, professors and students as well as pastors and lay leaders in the churches. And this is because for the last 21 years or so, Ken has been producing and editing the Mars Hill Audio Journal for exactly this kind of an audience. Uh, the journal is aimed at both people in the academy as well as church leaders and really anyone else interested in understanding um, modern culture and the relationship of the church to modern culture. So in this way, Ken's work is really bringing together these two worlds of church and academy and it, it, his work uh, exemplifies the kind of bridging of church and university that we are working toward at McLaurin CSF. 
If you're not already familiar with the Mars Hill Audio Journal, I'm very excited that we get the chance to introduce you to that today. If you purchased a ticket for the seminar, included in that ticket price was a year subscription, MP3 subscription to the Mars Hill Audio Journal. Um, the journal comes out every other month and it consists of audio interviews with academics and uh, public intellectuals on topics that in some way bear on the church's relationship to modern culture. In order to give you just a flavor of the kinds of interviews that uh, Ken conducts in the first issue that you receive as part of that subscription, um, it's, it's going to feature an all-star lineup that includes interviews with historian George Marsden, the theologian David Bentley Hart, the biblical critic and theologian N.T. Wright, and uh, the artist uh, Mako Fujimura. Ken's interviews with the journal are so consistently well done uh, and thought-provoking that we at McLaurin have started for the last couple of years doing a monthly dinner discussing uh, one of them. And once again, you can see just how well what Ken is doing fits with um, our mission. Ken has been able to produce these really helpful and insightful conversations for the rest of us because his own background uh, brings together theological training with a, a, a deep and abiding interest in culture and in intellectual life. So, so Ken has a degree in film theory and criticism from the University of Maryland, as well as an MA in religion from Westminster Seminary in Philadelphia. Before starting the Mars Hill Audio Journal, Ken worked as a magazine editor for This World, a journal of religion and public life, as well as the magazine Eternity. He also spent eight years working as a producer and editor for NPR's Morning Edition and All Things Considered. And in addition to publishing in numerous periodicals, he's the author of the book All God's Children in Blue Suede Shoes, Christians and Popular Culture, um, a new edition of which has just been released last year. So we are so glad to have Ken here with us today uh, to think about the church's relationship to the life of the mind. Uh, please join me in giving him a warm welcome to the Twin Cities. Thank you very much. It's good to be here and I, uh, <clears throat> in accepting and planning uh, these talks, accepting an invitation and planning a have a great sense of affinity with McLaurin CSF. I've known about their work for some time and uh, believe that we do share a, a common sense of vocation. The, uh, <clears throat> this is a big topic that we're <laughs> looking at today. And I always, I was saying to Brian last night that uh, when I prepare material for a group, mostly people I don't know, and more important than the fact I don't know you, I don't know what's on your bookshelf. Uh, I don't know what books you've read lately. Uh, I'm often asked uh, for lists of books to help understand culture, and I tend to resist that, because um, I'm comfortable recommending the next book for someone, but if I don't know what they've already read, it's hard to, to know where to take them. Uh, and so in planning something like this and dealing with a, a topic that I've thought about pretty much my whole adult life uh, and discover that there are aspects of it that are more complicated <laughs> than I ever imagined. Uh, it, it, it's difficult to know where to begin and where to end. So, um, but it will end, just uh, be assured. <laughs> I wanna preface uh, this talk uh, with a few short passages from scripture. <clears throat> um, we will be talking about the question of faith and reason throughout the day. And I want to look at some passages that connect with that. Uh, and in order to avoid being too elusive or mysterious about why I chose the passages so early in the morning, let me explain that all of these texts relate to a theme of Christology and creation. They allude to or narrate the fact that creation is the work of the Logos of God. Uh, and that is something uh, that is not often 
appreciated. The depth of it is not often appreciated by, by conservative Christians uh, in, in America um, who kind of get past Christology as quickly as possible so they can get to soteriology, so they can talk about the questions of salvation. Um, in the many years I've been thinking about culture, I realized that uh, the se severing or separating of concern for creation with concern for redemption is one of the problems of modern faith churches. And uh, I was with a group of pastors recently, and one of whom said uh, he realized that a lot of his fellow pastors think that the Bible starts at Genesis 3 um, with the account of the fall. And the reality of the fall is more decisive and important to us than the reality of creation. Uh, these passages beg to differ <laughs> and uh, actually not just establish uh, the fact of creation, but the contour of creation uh, as shaped by the second person of the Trinity, which affirms the, uh, the significance and, and viability or the, the, the appropriateness of our thinking deeply uh, because all things are established by the word of God. So first from the Gospel of John, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. And then jumping down a few verses, the true light, which enlightens everyone, <clears throat> was coming into the world. We'll be talking about the enlightenment later, hint, hint. <laughs> the true light, which enlightens everyone, was coming into the world. Then from the letter to the Hebrews, Again, from the very beginning of the letter, long ago, at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son, whom he appointed the heir of all things, through whom also he created the world. He is the radiance of the glory of God, and that idea of light, and the exact imprint of his nature, and he upholds the universe by the word of his power. And then the last text from the epistle to the Colossians, echoing very similar themes. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created, in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. If I could paraphrase that, all things find their coherence in Christ. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. Now the overall title as has been explained and is, is displayed on the poster, The Life of the Mind and the Life of the Church. When I was told that they had a uh, regular church and university event here in Twin Cities, I was thrilled to accept this invitation because of my work uh, for 20 some years with Mars Hill Audio, but before that in, in the journalistic work I did uh, has, has focused um, uh, on th theologically informed cultural analysis, and most of the thinkers I engage are connected to universities. But I think that the church, and not the university, the church and local churches uh, are the site in which most important cultural activity should be happening. Um, I, 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 most of my friends are academicians, uh, and, uh, or, or clergy, I guess. Uh, and it is unfortunate how often th their two worlds do not intersect. Uh, my, my academic friends, I worry sometimes, are, uh, have given up on the church. Uh, they don't expect the church to take seriously the life of the mind. Uh, and they uh, often don't have a way of figuring out exactly where into the church's life uh, their own vocation fits. And sometimes they're quite happy with that um, because they have their own little communities 
uh, that are uh, fulfilling and affirming. Uh, Mark Knoll, uh, who co-wrote a book uh, with James Turner recently, uh, James Turner, another historian, Roman Catholic historian at Notre Dame, a uh, book called The Future of Christian Learning. Uh, Knoll talks about how among evangelical Christians, uh, many who discover the joys of the life of the mind uh, don't find a uh, safe harbor uh, for their interests uh, in the life of the church, and they find other uh, fellowships in which their intellectual life uh, can flourish and and uh, and uh, be again be be affirmed. I, I'm not opposed to such fellowships, but I do think that uh, it's a shame that that uh, the church hasn't figured out ways to uh, to engage um, with uh, with intellectual life uh, people who have have uh, particular intellectual vocations. Now I want to. There's a temptation, if we think of the life of the mind and the life of the church, and, or we think of the church and the university, there's a temptation to think of these two institutions as having separate but equal jurisdictions in some way. Uh, that one has authority and influence over something we call spiritual life, and the other uh, over something we call intellectual life. And I think if we think of it that way, and we think, oh, well, isn't it wonderful that with these two these two realms are meeting for at least half a day to, to talk about mutual concerns. If we think about them in that separate but equal terms, we've already introduced lots of problems. Uh, part of the problem is that I think we face as a culture, but, and part of the problem of the church in our culture is the separating of spiritual life from intellectual life, and I'll talk more about that in a minute. I think that actually would not, doesn't just work against the health of those, institution, those two institutions. Uh, it works against the health of the broader society as Christians aim to serve their neighbors. That false division that, especially since the 18th century, has been present uh, between faith and reason uh, is, a, is a huge source of, uh, of problems for us culturally. And that segregation is one of the fundamental causes of most of the cultural disorders that, I th that we currently face. I meet many people who think that if only we could return to the 18th century uh, bargain, uh, we could fix everything. That uh, the problems that we have, for instance, with what are perceived as threats to religious freedom, if only we, we could re recover the founder's vision, everything would be hunky-dory. My sense is the founder's vision was profoundly uh, mistaken f from the get-go, and returning to the 18th century is not, not really going to help us because there were already some false understandings of the relationship between faith and reason uh, in the 18th century. Now, I hope that some of this, what may seem mysterious claims, become clear over the course of the day. And if they don't, we do have Q&A time, so. Now, the structure uh, of the day, we have three themes that I'll be addressing. First, uh, anti-intellectualism in the church, what feeds it and why it should be vigorously combated. Well, first, my first talk. And then secondly, why the vocation of the university needs the church's life and the church's theological insights and not just uh, the university's own religious studies programs. And then third, why the church's adversaries would really like to widen the gap between spiritual and intellectual pursuits, keep that wall of division uh, in place. Uh, that's, it's better off for everybody if we just keep, uh, keep those two things separate and don't confuse them. And there is a strong and long-standing conviction that society works best when those two things are, are, are kept not just distinct but, but uh, separated. And I hope to set these themes in the context of uh, cultural and theological developments of the past few decades, but also, um, well, cultural and theological developments of, of a number of centuries, which in the past few decades have come under uh, greater scrutiny. So first, why does the church need to think? Why is the church's intellectual uh, life important? And I should say at the outset that, uh, that I, I think that, that actually, contrary to what many people might think, I think that conservative churches in this country are now more committed to anti-intellectualism than they were 40 years ago, which uh, we can talk about that. And I think that's, uh, I, I pick 40 years ago because that's, at, that's the time when I started to think about this question. Uh, 
so, so I, I, I've been watching it that long, and, and, uh, and it, it's a concern that I've had uh, since then, but I think it actually, the situation has gotten worse, and we can, uh, I can discuss some, some indicators of that. 1972, a little more than 40 years ago, the Reverend John Stott, uh, English preacher and probably the most respected evangelical preacher theologian in the world at the time, gave an address at the InterVarsity Fellowship Annual Conference and spoke on the place of the mind in the Christian life. And that address was subsequently published in a small paperback book called Your Mind Matters. Just out of curiosity, anybody remember that book? Uh, okay, good. Now Stott was a very perceptive and pastoral preacher theologian, uh, very attentive to uh, the, the spirit of the age. And his selection at that time of that particular topic uh, to address the leaders of InterVarsity uh, was not arbitrary or capricious. When it was published, the book was perceived as a gentle rebuke of some of the more extreme and explicit expressions of irrationalism that had been nurtured within the charismatic movement. In fact, he ex explicitly mentions that at the beginning of the book as one of the concerns he had. <clears throat> I remember at just about that time, actually maybe a, a year later, having a conversation with a friend uh, who belonged to a, a, a large charismatic church in Washington where I was living at the time. And uh, I was struck very dramatically by the, her confidence in her irrationality. <clears throat> um, she, and what she said, uh, she said her life is so much better since she received the baptism of the Holy Spirit because she didn't need to think about her faith anymore. And this was such a source of comfort for her. <clears throat> now at the time, I remember thinking, and I, I remember it very dramatically, I remember exactly where, where I was sitting and what was going on around when, when, the, when I heard this utterance, this prophetic utterance. Uh, and my first thought was, why would you assume it's a good thing to not have to think about your faith? Where did you get the idea that that was a good thing uh, or, and a source of appropriate comfort? Okay, this is 1973 or so. Um, she could have absorbed that assumption from various absurdist playwrights from the mid-20th century, or film directors, or other esoteric irrationalist movements that, uh, that show up throughout the 20th century. I had actually taken a, a class, I was just, just, actually I was in college at the time and was taking a course, I think the same year, in modern drama, and I remember theater of the absurd, theater of cruelty, all these uh, nihilistic movements, uh, particularly in, in drama in the 20th century. She could have absorbed it from there, but I kind of doubt it. Um, she was more likely to pick it up from popular culture in the late 1960s and 1970s, uh, a combination of warmed over existentialism and winds from the East combined to produce the New Age movement, first labeled as such, I think in 73 or 74. And the New Age movement promoted expressions of spirituality that in some instances celebrated irrationality and that celebration spilled over into popular music and television and movies and fiction and bumper stickers. So she could have been influenced by that and probably was to some extent, but most likely, sadly, she was influenced by her own religious tradition because American evangelicalism has a persistent streak of anti-intellectualism uh, for reasons I'll try to outline in a minute. So 1972, John Stott saw this growing spirit of anti-intellectualism in the culture at large and saw it uh, within the church as well. In the culture at large, it was in part encouraged by a very pragmatic bent that goes back at least to Sir Francis Bacon's assertion that uh, knowledge is power, and hence, if knowledge isn't useful, if knowledge isn't useful for very practical things, then, then it's entirely useless. Uh, the modern world breeds pragmatists, Stott observed in his book. He said, people who first question about, whose first question about any idea is not, is it true, but does it work? Young people tend to be activists, dedicated supporters of a cause, though without always inquiring closely either whether their cause is a good end to pursue or whether this action is the best way 
uh, the best means by which to pursue it. When the book uh, version of this address was published, Stott said that he toyed with giving it the subtitle, The Misery and Menace of Mindless Christianity. But he makes it clear that he's not championing a kind of dry and humorless and academic Christianity. Rather, he wanted to encourage a warm devotion set on fire by truth. Now, I was in college when this book was published, and I was just beginning to be interested in more serious study of theology, and I read it very eagerly, uh, in part because I realized that we were living in a time of dramatic cultural change, and that the church had to be wise about how it was going to respond to the kinds of cultural changes uh, we were experiencing. The language of cultural revolution was common, and in retrospect, I think that it was justified. And if ever there's a time when mindless Christianity is likely to produce menacing consequences, it's when the surrounding culture is embracing new conventions of thought, new institutional arrangements, and new everyday practices. Discernment is always an important part of Christian discipleship, and discernment is especially necessary under conditions of radical cultural change. So, in a sense, the first answer to the question, why does the church need to think, was, is because of the necessity of discernment, which I link to the biblical mandate that we not be conformed uh, to this world. Now, we live in a time when many in the church have been beguiled to embrace the conventional modern belief that sincerity and commitment are more valuable than discernment. In politics, in education, in the arts, and sadly sometimes in the church, unvarnished passion is often more honored than is wisdom. In an anthology exploring problems in higher education, theologian Stanley Hauerwas, in one of the essays, frets that Christian seminaries often value personal dynamism and winsomeness more than disciplined training. And he thinks that's a huge problem for the church. He writes, seminaries can no longer afford to turn down anyone who wants to study for the ministry. So there's a financial, you know, we'll, t we'll let you come in no matter what your grades were as, as an undergraduate. Moreover, the best and the brightest are not necessarily going into the ministry. This, Howard was only the second person I've seen observe this. First was uh, a Presbyterian minister I heard at a conference about 20 years ago exhort the people he was speaking to uh, not to send uh, mediocre young people into the ministry. He said, unfortunately, we, uh, we tend to think if we have children who are really bright, we push them into the professions. Uh, we push them into law or business or uh, medicine, but we don't think, well, he's really smart, he should become a minister. Um, if he's good with people, we'll send him, uh, <laughs> he's affable, uh, we'll send him into the seminary. And that's exactly what Howard was is saying here also. The ministry is not exactly a status profession, and many seminary students have felt called to the ministry because they like to work with people, but it has never occurred to them that the work they are to do with people in the name of Jesus Christ means more than being a nice person. Indeed, I suspect the reason why so many leave the ministry or find themselves in such compromised positions in the ministry is due to the unrelieved boredom of facing a lifetime of being nice. <laughs> ah, that's Stanley Harawas. <laughs> And then I have to share this wonderful anecdote, and it, ac it actually is pertinent, <laughs> as well as amusing. Some years ago, Howard Wass writes, I was advising a first year student in an effort to help him select his courses, undergraduate. He'd gone to the University of Texas where he'd majored in business administration. Oh no, this must have been a graduate class, graduates, yeah, must have been when he was at uh, either Notre Dame or Duke. After graduating, he had worked for several years before he discovered he wanted to be a minister. I asked him if he'd taken any courses in the humanities during his undergraduate years. He said that he had a few courses in the humanities, so I asked him if he had ever taken any philosophy. He said, I am not sure. 
I thought that was either the smartest or the dumbest answer I'd ever heard. <laughs> to find out which, <laughs> I asked him if he'd ever read Plato. He responded, who? Now, Hauerwas concludes, I would be the last person to argue that you need to know who Plato is to worship Jesus Christ. But if you are to be a minister trained to lead a congregation through the wilderness of this society called America, I certainly think you not only need to know who Plato was, but why Plato was such an important figure for Origen and Augustine. Of course, the ordinary Christian probably doesn't care whether the minister does or doesn't know Plato or Augustine. But it is my contention that anyone serving in the ministry today who lacks the resources Augustine provides risks abandoning their congregation to the omnivorous desires of the market. Who more than Augustine can teach us what it means to be possessed by that which we think we desire by our own free will? The church needs serious thinkers, especially among its clergy, but not just among its clergy. First of all, because faithfulness requires discernment. Discernment is not an irrational quality, it's a function of practical reason. Now, as I've suggested, I've throughout my whole adult life been interested in the question of why Christians, and especially my contemporaries, have been indulgent toward anti-intellectualism. Sometimes it's defended as a safe alternative to intellectual arrogance. Well, if you have to choose between being an egghead who's probably arrogant and proud, or, or being just a kind of regular Joe guffawing through life, uh, clearly it would be morally safer uh, to choose the latter path. And yet, it should be obvious, just listen to talk radio or go online, that there are people who are smugly proud of their lack of learning, who are proud of the fact that they're impatient with careful argumentation. So it seems that anti-intellectualism is just as morally perilous as being uh, intellectually oriented. Aversion to serious thinking uh, has occasionally been nourished in uh, conservative Christian circles by a misplaced zeal to honor the sovereignty of God in our salvation. And as I wrote that sentence, I thought, gee, it, it's up to us to protect the sovereignty of God. That's kind of a weird paradox there, but anyway. Dallas Willard explains, and this was actually an, a, a new interpretation to me. I hadn't run across this, but it is plausible. Willard says that among some Christians, knowledge was classed as works or as the result of merely human effort. It was opposed to the miraculous work of grace, which was supposed to produce belief or faith without human knowledge or even in opposition to it. You are saved by grace through faith, as the Apostle Paul famously said, and, the fa and faith was the gift of God, not a result of human effort, in order that no one would be in a position to boast of his or her superiority. Knowledge was pushed away as essential to saving faith, having nothing to do with it. There was no thought that such faith, though still a gift, might actually involve knowledge as an essential part or support, or that knowledge, too, could be a gift of God without losing its inner character as knowledge possibly even a gift essential to the gift of faith. Sometimes the anti-intellectual strain in the life of the church is defended in the name of a commitment to a populist apologetics. If the church is going to reach more people, then it has to be willing to identify with popular attitudes and prejudices. And uh, we, we live in a time now and have for some time in, in which uh, intellectual pursuits are considered elitist, and uh, that, that's not where most people are. Again, just turn the television set on, reality TV, hello. Uh, so uh, if the surrounding culture is suspicious of intellectual maturity, then Christians have to be willing to be fools for Christ so as to win more souls. So in other words, being mentally careless is a good marketing strategy uh, for the gospel. As I thought about this particular defense of anti-intellectualism, I was reminded of a book uh, whose author I interviewed uh, several years ago. Uh, it came out in 2008, a book called The Anti-Intellectual Presidency 
the decline of presidential rhetoric from George Washington to George W. Bush. Thank you for that <laughs> punctuation there. A book that, that demonstrates Christians aren't the only ones who dumb things down in order to promote their popularity. And the author of this book, uh, Irvin Lim, I believe his last name was, L-I-M, uh, points out how um, for some time, uh, th through the 20th century and possibly back even earlier, uh, presidential candidates have realized that platitudes and punchlines sell votes uh, as well as they sell products. And presidential speechwriters have been working for decades to make their candidates look less formal and more down to earth. I was amused to find out that Richard Nixon uh, was really interested in connecting with truckers and kind of the average man, and <laughs> didn't quite have the rhetorical register to connect with them, and actually had people helping him sound a little less uh, like he sounded. <laughs> uh, swapping stories with Joe Sixpack was not a natural part of Nixon's routine. And then, who knew, Al Gore spent hundreds of thousands of dollars on consultants to undo the effects of the hundreds of thousands he'd spent earlier on his Ivy League education. <laughs> Observers aren't sure whether George W. Bush had to make quite as significant an investment. <laughs> the marketing defense of anti-intellectualism is a very troubling one. First of all, because it reduces evangelism to a sales pitch with little or no decisive content. And very few people would be so crass as to affirm that in so many words. But I do think that behind the neglect of intellectual life in Christian circles, there is a deep lack of confidence that faith and reason are harmonious partners in human experience. I think that both by believers and non-believers, faith is seen more as a matter of will than of reason. And we are a culture that celebrates choice. We're a pro-choice culture, deeply so. <clears throat> Religion in general is assumed by non-believers to be irrational or irrational. It's an expression of volition, not intellect. And while many Christians would dispute the charge that their faith is irrational, although some might embrace it, I think at some level they're not entirely confident that religious knowledge is real knowledge. <clears throat> In 1912, Presbyterian theologian J. Gresham Machen, in an essay he wrote on church and culture, commented how the kind of schooling received by many Christians promoted both an, an anti-intellectual attitude and a kind of dualistic assumption, again, that faith and reason were separate. He says, our whole system of school and college education is so constituted as to keep religion and culture as far apart as possible and ignore the question of the relationship between them. On five or six days of the week, we are engaged in the acquisition of knowledge. From this activity, the study of religion was banished. This is 1912. This is long before Ma Madeleine Murray O'Hare got the Supreme Court to eliminate school prayer. We studied natural science without considering its bearing or lack of bearing upon natural theology or upon revelation. We studied Greek without opening the New Testament. We studied history with careful avoidance of that greatest of historical mo movements which was ushered in by the preaching of Jesus. In philosophy, the vital importance of the study of religion could not entirely be concealed, but it was kept as far as possible in the background. On Sundays, on the other hand, we had religious instruction that called for little exercise of the intellect. Careful preparation for Sunday school lessons, as for lessons in mathematics or Latin, was unknown. Just in case you thought there was a golden age prior to the 1960s, <laughs> it was 1912. Religion seemed to be something that had to do only with the emotions and the will, leaving the intellect to secular studies. What wonder that after such training, we came to regard religion and culture as belonging to two entirely separate compartments of the soul and their union as involving the destruction of both. That last line is very important. Religion is threatened if 
it's too contaminated by culture, particularly by intellectual life. And culture and intellectual life is threatened if it's contaminated by religion. That is a, a, an assumption that is uh, widely held and not just by uh, non-believers. More recently, uh, I mentioned Dallas Willard a moment ago, uh, and the quote that I read was from his book called Knowing Christ Today, subtitled Why We Can Trust Spiritual Knowledge. Willard died recently, uh, within the past couple of years. He taught philosophy at USC and I think was a visiting professor at UCLA. <clears throat> and in this book he writes, serious and thoughtful Christians today find themselves in a quandary about knowledge. Knowledge on the one hand, religious belief and practice on the other. It is a socially imposed quandary. In the context of modern life and thought, they are urged to treat their central beliefs as something other than knowledge, something in fact far short of knowledge. Those beliefs are to be relegated to the categories of sincere opinion, emotion, blind commitment, or behavior traditional for their social group. And yet they cannot escape the awareness that those beliefs do most certainly come into conflict with what is regarded as knowledge in educational and professional circles of public life. This conflict has profound effects upon how they hold and practice religious beliefs and how they present them to others. And later in the book, he observes the relationship of religion to knowledge has become severely misunderstood and distorted over the last two centuries. And I would argue it's actually longer than that. In particular, it has become the accepted view that religion stands free of knowledge, that it requires only faith or commitment. In some quarters, great faith, great faith has become equated with a belief or commitment that manages to sustain itself with great effort against knowledge, or at least with no support from knowledge. Faith is then regarded as essentially a kind of struggle. Some speak of the lonely person of faith as an admirable but, admirable but odd manifestation of heroic willpower. Now this uh, identification of faith with volition, very important, I'll be coming back to this in the next talk also, how will and reason become separated. It's not just that faith and reason become separated, but will and reason become separated in modern culture. Um, and that severing has some complex historical sources, which we'll be talking about uh, both uh, in, uh, in a minute, but also in the second talk. But since we're talking particularly about the problem of anti-intellectualism among evangelicals, I want to uh, just uh, a few other notes from some other observers. Uh, first from historian Mark Knoll, uh, who's probably our best uh, evangelical church historian, focusing principally on American church history. But 20 years ago, Noel wrote a book that many of you are probably familiar with called The Scandal of the Evangelical Mind. Uh, and in that book, he identifies revivalism as one of the sources of suspicion of serious thought among conservative Christians. And revivalism works in multiple ways at different levels to promote uh, anti-intellectualism, not just in its uh, promotion of a kind of immediate emotional response to preaching, but more subtly in, in, in how it organizes a, a re religious experience. Noel points out that revivalism promoted a new kind of leadership among Christians. Re revivalism elevated the standing of the, what we might call the religious entrepreneur, uh, the kind of freelance preacher. <clears throat> Direct, personal, popular, uh, the, the kind of leadership was direct leadership, personal and popular, dependent much more on the spe speaker's ability to draw a crowd than upon the speaker's place in an established hierarchy. I want to go out on a limb here and say that the ability to attract a crowd was probably not based on skills of subtle reasoning, but on volitional appeals that were more familiar to advertisers than to scholars. <clears throat> this popular appeal, Noel argued, undercut the traditional authority of churches and the traditional authority of the connection of churches to their past, to their history, and to their theological history, to their creedal history, confessional history. Ecclesiastical life remained important, but not nearly as significant as the decision 
of the individual close to Christ. Again, note the, voli the volitional vocabulary, decision rather than conclusion. Uh, I remember Billy Graham's magazine for years was called Decision Magazine, wasn't it? The Hour of Decision was the radio program Billy Graham was on. It's, it's pro-choice. It's about making a choice for Jesus, right? Not a conclusion, a decision. <clears throat> Revivalism promoted, Noel argues, both individualism, immediatism, that is the... Uh, disparaging of the mediation of institutions and history and creeds and bodies of knowledge. The experience that we had with God was an immediate one. Uh, it, it need not even involve thinking. Uh, individualism, immediatism, and anti-traditionalism, all of which reinforce anti-intellectualism. Revivalism, Noel writes, called people to Christ as a way of escaping tradition, including traditional learning. They called upon individuals to take the step of faith for themselves. In so doing, they often left the impression that individual believers could accept nothing from others. Everything of value in the Christian life had to come from the individual's own choice, not just personal faith, but every scrap of wisdom, understanding, and conviction about the faith. This is a profoundly significant part of uh, our religious history, um, some of you may know Nathan Hatch's book, The Democratization of American Christianity, which appeared a couple years before this book, I think, actually 89 or so. And Hatch, uh, another church historian, documents really, really well how the, uh, this assumption of immediacy, that is, me and Jesus, the, the individual believer and God connected without any necessary mediation, not just mediation of priests or sacraments, but no mediation of traditions or no mediation of the church as such, no, and no mediation of bodies of knowledge. Um, I'm, I'm blanking on the name of the, uh, of the leader, but it was uh, one of the uh, 19th century um, leaders of, uh, who, who founded, uh, I think, that either the, the Church of God, I think, uh, in, his, in one of his articles talked about how when he reads the Bible every day, he reads it as if he's coming to the text for the very first time, and he's as intolerant of conclusions he arrived at yesterday when he read the text as he is of venerable or allegedly venerable traditions of, of, of orthodoxy. He wants to encounter God right now, not just without the mediation of the church or creeds or confessions, but without the mediation of his own memory. It's Alzheimer's Christianity here. <laughs> And that was a true, that's true faith. True faith is that, 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 that immediate kind of encounter. Uh, I, it's shocking that, that such a theological position would be labeled conservative Christianity. It's, it's, it's as radical as it gets. Religious disestablishment, Noel points out, <clears throat> which we tend to celebrate. Oh, isn't it wonderful? We have freedom of religion and we have uh, a kind of marketplace of religion free open marketplace. Uh, well, again, that reinforced an emphasis on individual volitional religion rather than communal and rational religion. The combination of revivalism and disestablishment, Noel writes, meant that pragmatic concerns would always prevail over principle. What the churches required were results or they would simply go out of business. The combination of revivalism and disestablishment also predisposed believers to utilitarian apologetics, to functional theology. Now they tended to ask, what would most readily promote expansion of the church? What would most forcefully advance the cause of the church and society? Not what's true or what, what are the really important truths that we need to be attending to now, no matter how unpopular they might be or no matter how implausible they might be to our contemporaries. I see this very often. Uh, uh, among Christian leaders, clergy and parachurch leaders, when they're exposed to new ideas, you can almost see them thinking, can I sell that idea or not? And, and I, I sometimes get the impression they think if that, that idea seems so off the radar of their constituency that they're just going to shelve it. Maybe I'll get around to it eventually. It may be that that idea is the most important thing for shaping their ministry, but if they can't sell it in a hurry, 
uh, again, that, that's unfortunately that they're cast into that position of being, as I like to say, more like cruise directors than shepherds, uh, that they're, they're not, they, they have a clipboard and not a, a crook with them. Uh, Noel, Noel says that this situation created a lot of difficulty for the life of the mind. Uh, American evangelicals never doubted that Christianity was the truth. They never doubted that Christian principles should illuminate every part of life. What they did do, however, in the years, particularly, and he's looking at the years between the Revolution and the Civil War, was to make most questions of truth into questions of practicality. What message would be most effective? What do people most want to hear? What can we say that will both convert the people and draw them to our church? The heavy pressure for results meant that very little time or energy was available to think about God and nature, God and society, God and beauty, or God in the shape of the human mind. In the context of the early United States, with the pragmatic challenge of subduing the wilderness and civilizing a barbarian society, these traditional issues of Christian learning, these matters of primary importance to a Christian mind became largely irrelevant. Now, revivalism has more recently been identified as a major factor in promoting anti-intellectualism by pastor theologian Gordon Smith, who's a pastor in the Christian Missionary Alliance Church. I think he taught at Regent College. He was a visiting professor. He has a brand new book out, and I'm blanking on the title. I haven't read it yet, but his earlier book was called Transforming Conversion. And it's on the question of, do we understand conversion as a kind of a, a point in time in which a switch is thrown Kind of, so there's a time in our lives when we're not converted and there's a time in life when we are converted. Or do we understand conversion as a process that we participate in throughout our whole lives? So we, we continue to be converted. Uh, and he argues that the biblical view is more of conversion as perhaps having a definitive beginning but being perpetuated throughout our, our lives. And he's particularly interested in the question of maturity. The, the, the new book, I think it's something like Called to be Saints. It's, uh, he, he is uh, one of several who are really addressing the question of the loss of the ideal of maturity in Christian discipleship. Uh, uh, and in that book, he suggests that, uh, that revivalism led to a loss or contributed to a loss of commitment to promoting spiritual maturity. He writes, a one-dimensional perspective on the human person that too closely links our salvation with our will can easily cause those within the tradition to think that they are transformed by the surrender of the will rather than by the renewal of the mind. Such a perspective discounts the significant place that the intellect and the affections have in human transformation. What he's talking about here is that appeals and I sat through many of these appeals in which you're basically called to just surrender your will to, to, to God. Not, I'm not saying that's wrong, but the idea that, that, that everything will be properly aligned if only you reorient volition and you don't really have to do anything with your mind. Uh, and so every week you would hear a, an altar call that basically called you to realign the will. It's kind of like a kind of spiritual chiropractic, I guess. It's kind of some kind of, uh, but not the renewing of the mind, which the Apostle Paul says that's, that's the definitive way of, of, of orienting ourselves properly to, toward God. Uh, and later in his book, Smith writes, we live in an era of evangelicalism when the devoted scholar, the devoted scholar, is viewed almost as an oxymoron. On one side are those who do not appreciate that the best scholarship is informed by prayer, and on the others are those who do not recognize that prayer and worship must be informed by good scholarship, and that study, learning, and libraries are vital to the health and vitality of the church. We have a generation of Christians who do not appreciate what it means to love God with one's whole mind, who do not see that transformation comes through the renewal of the mind, and that Christian mission is about taking every thought captive to obey Christ. And then finally, uh, closing moments here, Leslie Newbigin, a uh, wonderful missiologist uh, and theologian, um, who uh, in his book called Truth to Tell, The Gospel is Public Truth, which I think I'll refer to later today also, he says it's not often acknowledged that evangelism means calling people to believe something which is radically different from what is normally accepted as public truth. 
It calls for a conversion not only of the heart and will, but of the mind. A serious commitment to evangelism, to the telling of the story which the church is sent to tell, means a radical questioning of reigning assumptions about public life. It is to affirm the gospel not only as an invitation to a private and personal decision, but as public truth which ought to be acknowledged as true for the whole of the life of society. Again, Romans 12, 1 and 2 have been hovering in my head throughout this talk because the idea of discernment, the idea of wisdom, the idea of maturity, uh, the idea of resisting conformity uh, to, to, the, to the spirit of the world involves a, a, a kind of intellectual deliberateness. Uh, it, it, it's, uh, and it's, you can see, see this intellectual vitality in the life of the early church as the church is trying to wrestle with the, the consequences for uh, thinking about all of life of the fact of the death, resurrection, and ascension of, of Christ. Um, a time when the church's greatest thinkers were also preacher pastors. Uh, and there was absolutely no discontinuity between being uh, uh, committed to, to serious uh, thinking and, and, to, and, in fact, being a good pastor required that kind of serious thinking. We're going to take a break, and let's see, what's the uh, 10.30 we come back? What's the... You want to tell us what we're doing? And we will come back and we will talk about uh, what the... Uh, what the, the connections between faith and reason might look like on the other side of uh, this institutional divide, and that is uh, for the life of the university. Thank you. Thank you.